you give us by nature of your character, the security you give us by the, your promises, and by your testimony of who you are and what you have done in your word. We can trust you. We can bank on you. We can rest in you. Uh, Lord, where would we be without your promise? Where would we be without your character? If, even if um, you made the boldest and the most greatest of statements in your word, but your character was not trustworthy, it would be meaningless. What a, what a thrill among, to be those among the entire inhabited world to be a, a blood-bought, adopted Christian. I mean, among all of the false religions of the world, we alone get to worship you, the one true God who actually makes promises, who is actually uh, truthful, who always uh, speaks what is right and real and righteous and edifying, glorifying to your own name and edifying to your children. And so we just thank you. We thank you. It's the greatest privilege to worship you. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you this morning as your church. And um, Lord, as we direct our attention to your word, uh, I just pray that you would get glory for yourself, even in how we listen, and even as we respond. So increase our faith as we listen this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you may take a seat. I'm going to invite you to grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 4. I began this last week with every intention of moving on to the next story, the next pericope, the next section of Mark 4, and, and uh, lo and behold, Wednesday came, and um, in God's providence, I have, a, I have a longtime friend about 20 years ago, I did an internship in, in Utah with a, a dear friend who, is a church, who was a church planner for, for many decades in um, Payson, Utah, and he and his wife and their children were, have just become dear friends over the years, and um, several years ago, about three years ago, she came down with uh, pan pancreatic cancer, and, and she died on Saturday, and so well, when I got the news, I canceled some things and rearranged my schedule and jumped on a plane Wednesday morning, and so on my flight up to Salt Lake, I, uh, I, spent, I spent the, uh, the flight in conversation with Thomas Hooker, who was a uh, pastor in the uh, 17th century. And um, he did all the talking, uh, as always works with those dead guys. But I picked up his book, um, uh, The Application of Redemption. And there's a section in that book on meditating on your sin. And I was just, I was just taken away with the idea of, of what he was describing by way of meditation and considering the words of God. And between that and uh, a couple of other things, namely, uh, there were some things that I didn't say last week that I was hoping to get to. And... To make matters worse, Smed asked the very insightful question in the Q&A, what prevents good listening? And we talked very briefly. I kind of just scratched the surface of some things that were on my heart, particularly about looking to the Lord to remove anything about you, any waywardness within you, to just discipline you or chasten you in any fashion that would help you to listen to his word better. But there were some specifics that I was thinking about, and by the time I finished that flight, um, some of the things that even Thomas Hooker had shared, uh, had, had written, I want to share with you this morning. And so as I, as I thought about it, I thought, you know, I don't want to be too quick to jump to the next section of Mark 4. I kind of want to go back. And not, uh, not that I want to re-preach anything, but just remind us of where we are and spend some more time thinking about those same truths, but even incorporating some other passages of Scripture to help. I just, I can't, I, I can't uh, say this enough. Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 25 is, is just one of the most compelling paragraphs in the gospel of Mark. It's just so unique, and it's so helpful and healthy and help-giving that I just don't want to be too quick. So pastorally, personally, as a Christian, I just want to spend more time there, so I'm going to drag you into it with me. So let's go back this week and look, look again at Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 25. Jesus said, uh, and he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on the lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed. Nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, he must hear. And he was saying to them, take care what you listen to. 
By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. If you were here last week, you remember we looked at uh, this charge to watch what you hear, and I even said it this way, above all else, guard your ears by considering First of all, the nature of revelation in verses 21 to 23, and then the nature of reception in verses 24 and 25. What does it actually mean to receive divine revelation? This is an important question. James actually, actually commands us to receive the word deeply implanted in our hearts. We have to be able to know what it looks like to receive the word, to embrace the word, to accept the word, and to hear it and hear it well. I titled this uh, discussion, it's more like a uh, topical study, it's more like a meditation, it's more like group counseling. We're just going to open up scripture together and just think, what does it look like to listen and listen well? Do we listen to God's word well? And I've titled this, Raising the bar on listening. Raising the bar. If you think of the high jump, you know, and uh, you just kind of take it up every a couple inches. You know, when everybody runs out of option, uh, runs out of opportunities to clear it, or everybody clears it, you raise it up a couple inches, and it keeps getting higher and higher and higher, and uh, the, the effort, it, it has to become more strenuous, the skill has to become more refined, and it starts to separate good high jumpers from better high jumpers. And there's an element where I think, you know, I want to do that as a listener. We kind of just want to raise the bar. It's going to require us to exert more effort, to think more soberly, to consider what it means to listen and listen well. And it's going to actually mean we have to look long and hard at some of these hindrances. And so since Smed asked a million dollar question last Sunday night, I'm going to just basically take the rest of our time this morning to continue answering that. And that's really what we're going to be doing here. Um, If we are going to move on to a higher standard of listening and listening well, you realize the value and the benefit, don't you? Look again at verse 24. Jesus said, take care. Let's mean, literally, watch out, look out for, beware of what you listen to. And then he says, by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And so if we have a measurement of what a, you know, if we thought of the high jump, We know what a good high jump looks like, and you measure that bar. Well, if we bring that over to the analogy that Jesus is making here, a standard of measure to evaluate what does quality listening look like? What actually constitutes good listening? If you talk to your kids, did you listen to the sermon uh, last last Sunday, or or in, in small group, or in youth ministry, or if we think about it, last week's Bible study, did we listen well? How do we measure that? What does that look like? What's the standard with which we would say, I compared my listening to this standard, and yes, I listened well. If that standard is extremely high, we receive, we get back, we get out of the truth according to what we put into it by way of a standard of listening. The higher our standard of listening, the more we receive and more will be given to us besides. And so if I put, if my standard of measurement is this, it's not like a tit for tat, God just gives me this. It's not only does he give me this, he gives me more besides. And so if my standard is this, then I get not only that, but even more besides. And what I get out of listening to the word of God is always even greater than my effort. But if I don't hear, if I don't have ears to hear, That's what he says in verse 25, whoever has, whoever has what? Well, from verse 23, ears to hear. To him more will be given. And whoever does not have ears to hear, even what he has will be taken away. So if we don't have ears to hear, our listening is negligible. Even whatever receptivity we would have had will be squandered because there was hearing loss incurred in the exposure to the truth that wasn't listened to. That's so sobering. That's just been haunting me as I think about the power of the word. The word of God is so powerful. It's so powerful that no spiritual pair of ears ever walks away unchanged. You are either a better listener or you got more deaf. 
You either incurred damage or became more sensitive. That's the only options. There's no such thing as flatlining, remaining neutral in our ability to hear the word of God. And so, if we're going to listen, we need to consider hindrances and helps for listening well. Uh, before I dive into some of these practical discussions and some tensions that happen when we listen, I, I just want to say this. I remember when I was in seminary, Pastor MacArthur used to say this all the time. He used to say, put yourself in a position of maximum blessing. Put yourself in a position of maximum blessing. And when you see what you get out of listening well in verses 24 and 25, you think about the position we put ourselves in if we have a strict standard of measurement, if we have a high bar, if we put a profound premium on listening to the Bible well, we get so much blessing, exponential blessing from God. It's almost like you, you, we look at the scriptures, we're blown away, but it's just the, the glory revealed herein is just incredible. And then I look at comparatively my effort to get at it. And sometimes I feel like a toddler with ADD, addicted to some chemical. I don't know. Just as bad as it could possibly be. I look at my effort to get to the scripture, and I'm like, do I have spiritual ADHD? I mean, I'm looking at the glories of God right here, and I'm thinking about, oh, is the coffee done brewing? Oh, did I make that email? Did I, oh, what about this? And, oh, let's just go for a jog. I, <laughs> I mean, the amount of distractions that can come to my brain in one exposure, in one sitting, trying to listen to the word is profound. And so I would say it this way, that there really couldn't be a more important text or truth to listen to, a more important exhortation to put into play in our lives than this one. Because if we obey this one exhortation, then we're going to obey all the exhortations better. Because the exhortation is take care of how you listen and watch what you listen to. And so what I've done is I've just kind of created three little tensions that I've seen in my own heart that become hindrances and helps. It's like a problem-solution type approach to thinking about meditation and listening and hearing and how we put into practice the Word of God or how we don't put into practice. I'll just warn you up front, uh, the outline is not that great. I'm really excited about the content, but the outline is pretty poor. So as you're listening to this, as you hear me describe it, just change it to whatever works better for you. This is not postmodernism, but it's just, trust me, it's going to be better. Like whatever you change it to, it's going to be a way better outline. So I tried to create an outline that just cap encapsulated this, these tensions, H a certain hindrance, going with a certain solution, and looking at how that would work in our own hearts. And so the first tension, I, 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 I was helped with uh, this by Thomas um, Hooker, and I titled it Vanity and Focus. Vanity and Focus. And the reason why I just took that vanity idea from, from Thomas Hooker, we'll get to that in a second, but the idea here is that a lot of times we have distraction in our life, and this could be compared to the soil, the soil that is, is shallow. It doesn't really have a depth of root. There's just a vanity to our hearing of God's word, and we might initially hear it, and we might have an initial positive response, but then... Uh, unbelievers, you know, will fall away. They, have an initial, they might have an initial positive response, fall away and never bear any fruit. But for a believer, sometimes we might start to fall into that at times. Even as a believer, we can start to see some of that same soil tendency that there is a superficiality about us. And sometimes we're distracted by the most mundane things. We're easily entertained and we're not singularly focused on truth. And this is, the, this is the heart or the mind that is easily distracted. It can jump from one thing to another. And, and I know I have to work hard at minimizing distractions. I, I, can, I can think that I'm doing really, really well when I'm listening to preaching or reading the Bible or considering a truth in a, in a book or a commentary or what have you. And I'm sitting there thinking about truth, trying to just remain focused, and, it, and one particular thought connects to another particular thought, which connects to a third particular thought and a fourth particular thought. And some of those might have been somewhat helpful. And the next thing you know, I'm thinking about something totally unrelated. And worse, it's just drivel. Unnecessary distraction. Not the better for ever having had that thought. What a waste. 
And so there's a vanity sometimes that prevents us. It's just it becomes a distraction. And honestly, these first two tensions are described here in one quote by Thomas Hooker. I'm going to read this to you. You can tell how excited I was about this book, so I pasted in a really long quote. Sorry for the long quote, but I I typed it in so you could follow along if that helps uh, on the PowerPoint. Thomas Hooker said this. He said, observe those wandering thoughts that are flitting and roving in a restless manner from one thing to another, like your fluttering butterflies, which fall upon many herbs, but settle and draw out honey from none. And I thought that was a good word picture of, I'm like, is he describing my brain? (laughs) The amount of capacity I have to jump from one thing to another in a superficial manner and never actually land and do anything with this truth? Observe, I say, whether those unsteady thoughts pass upon the multitude and variety of things which have no coherence with one another, no dependence upon another, but there and there and everywhere as your vagrant beggars that have no settled abode. Or else observe, though a man's thoughts be full of variety and uncertainty, straggling here and there, encompassing many coasts to and again, yet for the issue they border and and but for the most part upon some one subject. They 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 aim at one thing mainly. Though spaniel like, describing a dog wandering around, sniffing things out, they coast up and down and cross all ways and meet with multitudes in their course, yet their game is that which they look at. And so here, so he's describing two types of distractions. One is totally unconnected, and the other one is instead of thinking about what I'm supposed to be thinking about, I'm, all of these distractions kind of revolve around the same topic or the same subject. And those two descriptions are going to be our first two tensions. The vanity is the first one. So he goes on to describe this first one this way. If the variety and wondering of your imaginations be of the first kind... It issues merely out of the frothiness and emptiness of your understanding. Okay, before you're offended, accept that. I had to accept that. And keep reading. And it comes out of the wound which lies in the vanity of that faculty. Think about our understandings and think about the frothiness, the emptiness, like the foamy top of a cappuccino frappa latte thing (laughs) and it's just nothingness it's just vain as it is with a boat or bark that's put to sea if neither freight nor ballast every wave tosses it to and again the least breeze of wind that blows almost overturns it because it's empty it wants ballast and therefore must needs fail unsteadily so here when the understanding is not ballast, ballasted with the blessed truth of God, is not taught and furnished with the wisdom and holiness and comfort of the word, the stability and guidance of the rule, it floats up and down with frothy, foolish apprehensions. That's a mouthful, but that's a vivid picture of instead of having a ballast under the, under the boat, which keeps it steady and it keeps it weighted so that it's always upright, it just gets tossed to and fro. And so when I see this vanity in my heart, I see a vanity that I would be looking at the glories of the God who created us and saved us and could so quickly wander into emails and calendars and lunch, packing lunches and picking up from football practice. And I mean, some of those are even necessary. But I have to admit, if my heart goes there so quickly, I am not going to become a good listener until I confess to the Lord, I actually find a more natural attraction to those things than your word. That's hard. And that's not common. That's gracious when we come to that conclusion, when we can say what God says about our distractions. If our distractions are winning out over the word, then it's it's high time that we confess that to the Lord, that, Lord, honestly, I'm seeing in my heart here, I actually have a greater appetite at times for entertainment than for you. And we're never going to overcome 
the frothy, vain distractions which keep us from listening and listening well until we can admit what's true about that. Grab your Bibles and open up to Psalm 86. There's such a help here in Psalm 86 um, because the psalmist knows there's something we need here. We need a singular focus. And Thomas Hooker mentioned that. He said that when you lack ballast and you're so quickly distracted by vanity, the only thing that can give you that substance, that weightiness, is the word of God, the truth of God's character, the truth of his word. And, and so we need something significant to give us focus and get us out of our, our vain distractions. And so listen to this phrase in Psalm 86, verse 11. This is, I'm sure it's a familiar psalm. This is a very familiar verse to, to many of you. But now you get to, get to hear it in the context of thinking about how do I listen and listen well. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Now, David makes a very great statement here. I mean, he just starts by saying, teach me. Now, that, that's a great principle for thinking about how to listen and listen well. When I find my thoughts distracted like our, our proverbial butterfly flitting from uh, leaf to leaf and flower to flower and just never really landing and never really uh, meditating and staying put for long enough to actually listen and listen well, then start by just going to the Lord saying, Lord, teach me your way. You must be the one who teaches me because we've got a lot to overcome here. Remember my attention span? I'm like a toddler with spiritual ADHD. I mean, that's what we're working with here. And that's, I got to just confess that and admit that to you. So would you teach me? And then even in the prayer, he explains the, the result. I will walk in your truth. I mean, there's a resolve here. He's telling the Lord, Lord, I'm, I need you to teach me. So teach me your way. And i.e., when you do that, then I will walk in your truth. There is a commitment to following through on whatever God teaches a commitment. I mean, even before the prayer is answered, teach me your way. And then if when I actually understand the implications of what you're, you're saying, and I agree with it, then I'll consider whether I follow through on it. No, he just knows. It's like, whatever you say, Lord, teach me, and I will walk in your truth. I'm committed to following it, even before I know where it leads. I just, I'm, all I have is brokenness about my inability to listen well, and confidence in your ability to get me there. But now listen to this last phrase. Unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart. Give me an undivided heart. Give me a singular focus, a singular passion, a singular intensity, a singular resolve that I would focus on you. My heart would be singularly focused on your glory, obeying you. Unite my heart in order to fear your name. In other words, the, the greatest threat here is having a heart that's just so vain, so distracted, going a hundred directions, attracted to this for a moment and attracted to this for a moment, and just undistracted, distracted in all these different directions. And he says, just unite it. Give me singular focus. And this is really the, the spiritual reality behind integrity. Even our word integrity uses the, the word integer, which means a whole number. And integrity is a wholeness. There's just like who you are on the outside is who you are on the inside. There's integrity there. And spiritually, that comes from having a singular, undivided heart, a singular, undivided life focus and purpose. And so here's where that focus comes from. It comes from being singularly focused on truth and on God and on Christ. Let me give you another example. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 113. The psalmist writes this. I hate those who are double-minded. Okay, so right here, we're, we're at this incredible uh, antithesis. In 113a, you have hate. In 113b, you have love. Um, you, you can't have one without the other. Biblically, it's, uh, those two are always... You, you can't love what's right without hating what's false. Here, you can't love God's law without hating those who are double-minded. 
And so the double-minded person is like James' um, double-minded man. He's unstable in all his ways. The instability of the double-minded man, the instability of the man who fears mankind. The guy who fears mankind is a double-minded, and he's unstable because he's always worshiping what other people think, and there are too many people to please. Even if I were committed to worshiping myself, I'm so fickle that whatever that would be aimed at would be changing by the nanosecond. There's just a double-mindedness and instability because of somebody who is distracted and pursuing all these other things. He says, I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your law. Where does the singular focus come from? Loving God's law. That's where that singular focus comes from. And so that's why, honestly, when we talk about this issue, this tension here, um, it's, it's not, we can't, we can't imagine that we would overcome that tendency to be vainly distracted from hearing God's word well until we get to the point where we've confessed, I actually love these things I'm distracted by more than your law. Give me a superior love for your law. Give me a superior love for your truth and your glory. Let's look at one more example. Look at Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is consistently sticking to his pattern in this sermon of exhorting with a negative and then a positive. Don't do this, but do this. Or don't think this, but think this. Or this is not true, but this is true. And he's, that's, that's no different than here in verse 19 and 20. He says in verse 19, Do not store up for your tre- yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but f- store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. It's a very clear exhortation. It's a negative and then a positive. Don't do this, but do this. And the reason why you don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth is because it's totally passing, it will not last, and you're going to be defrauded by all of your life's pursuits. Verse 20, the reason why you do store for yourselves treasures in heaven is because those things can't touch the inheritance in heaven. The inheritance that uh, we just talked about, Denny mentioned in the uh, communion message. Now, verse 21 starts with the word for. So when you see the word for, you can go back to the previous, usually, you can go back to the previous verses and say, okay, well, how can you say that, Jesus? Why, why are you saying that? Why is he telling me to store up treasure in heaven? The reason why, and the reason why he's also telling me to not store up treasures on earth is for this very reason. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you put the highest value on, your heart is going to pursue that and chase after that. Because there is an in, in, in inseparable connection between what you put the highest value on and where, where your life focus goes, that's why I'm telling you, don't store up treasures here. Put them there. Now watch what he does. This connects to a singular focus. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, verse 22, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is clear, and the NES has a footnote there, um, healthy or sincere, uh, the, 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 the most simple, most likely significance of that word clear here is the word singular. If it's a singular focus, the idea is if your eye is singular, It's kind of like trying to focus on two things at once. Trying to focus on two objects at once becomes really difficult, if not impossible. And Jesus just says, look, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if you're singular, if you have a singular focus, then the whole body is going to be full of light. And so picture the, the eye here. It's letting light into the body. It's like a skylight. It's letting light into the home. And so light is coming into your life. And if your eye is not, so verse 22 is talking about a singular focus. If your eye is not singular, in verse 23, if your eye is bad or evil, 
Your whole body will be full of darkness. So imagine trying to pursue and worship and chase down all these little desires and all these other distractions. You, you won't be able to see anything clearly. And if the only access for light to come into your life is through a singular devotion to God's word, how dark is your life going to be? It's going to be so dark. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The answer here to all these is that there has to be a superior love for the truth, and we have to confess that our distractions represent a vanity in our hearts. If that's, if that's a distraction to us, if that's a hindrance to us hearing the word of God, we've got to start there. Another distraction, another hindrance, and another help. The hindrance, number two, is an inordinate desire, and the, uh, the help here is delight in God. Inordinate desire, that's just a desire that's just blown past the boundaries of what's appropriate. This could be a, a desire that might be a part of a normal godly life, but it's become inordinate. It's become consuming. It's become a distracting focus. So in other words, there's some sort of idolatry here. There's some sort of desire that has blown past the boundaries of what would be good and proper and honoring to the Lord. This dis- distraction is due to having a singular fetish. It's an idol that's captured our focus. So in the first tension, we talked about if our minds are just skipping about and we hear a sermon and we just jump from subject to subject to subject. It's like a butterfly going from flower to flower so quickly we don't land. The second distraction that Thomas Hooker described was somebody that they're always going over here and at first glance it might be various topics or subjects, but when you really look at those topics or subjects that are distracting us, they're all around the same issue. He says that if your distractions are all around the same issue... In other words, there's something that you can't stop thinking about, and it's always distracting you, preventing you from hearing from God's word. It's become your focus. It might become your anxiety. It might become a fetish. It might become something that you are willing to sin to get or avoid. It's just this consuming, obsessive distraction, and you're thinking about it from every angle. That's clearly an indicator of an inordinate desire. Thomas Hooker writes this, If your wandering thoughts be of the second kind, such as be ranging up and down the variety of many objects, yet in the end, they ever border upon the same thing. They all kind of touch the same subject. It's then certain the wound lies in the affection, firstly. Some affection or other, either of love, fear, sorrow, hatred, is inordinate and violent. And that transports a man's apprehensions and thoughts to lackey after it, to send post from one coast to another quarter to lay them to lay out themselves in whatever special occasions shall present themselves that may give satisfaction as for instance when the covetous wretch is forced and constrained by conscience to set himself in a serious meditation about his own estate he is no sooner retired into the closet to attend that work but forthwith his affections present some earthly object starts something which concerns the benefit of his outward estate as one while may be the hazard of a debt that he's not likely to lose, his debtor's estate growing low, and he behind hand, that he pursues a game for the while. And so he's just describing you know, these distractions of a, a debtor who's owing him something or something that he owes. He's thinking, well, I've got some resources over here, but that guy's running out of money. He's not going to be able to pay me back. How am I going to, oh, what do I do? And it's the covetous man, and all of his thoughts are revolving around that particular subject. When he has run himself out of breath there and has gone as far as he can, anon there starts a fresh hair, a bargain that was of late offered to him, and he conceives there may be uh, a booty, something of benefit in that, that he also follows with much eagerness. He lays out his thoughts to the utmost, how he might contrive and compass it according to his desire. So he's trying to constrain everything according to his desires. He's just focused on this one particular object. No sooner is he off from that, but then he sends post haste to his, his lot, his inheritance, and his harvest, his income. There he is casting about how to order all to his own advantage. Here are now roving imaginations that range over hedge and ditch in much variety, but still they aim at the same thing. They border all together upon earthly contentments and how to compass them. They do center there still. Therefore, it's an argument undeniable. The unsteadiness of your thoughts arose from this distempered affection. And that's so true. Think about it, Christians. I mean, think about what we're talking about. We're talking about listening to what? 
put it on the spine of my Bible. The word of God. The expression, the utterance of our creator. It's just so indicting to me to think that there would be a subject that would capture my heart and start to compete with listening to God speaking to me. David Saxton wrote a, a great book called God's Battle Plan for the Mind, the, the Puritan Practice of Biblical Meditation. And he said this, he said, meditating and spending time with the Lord is like a good meal. It takes time to prepare and time to enjoy. Many Christian devotions resemble a person who's wolfing down a burger while driving on the freeway. However, our time with the Lord should look more like a couple who enjoy each aspect of a seven-course dinner. It simply takes a good amount of time to tune our heart toward God in divine meditation. I've asked myself that. Why, why wouldn't my listening be as natural, intense, eager, focused, undistracted as phone calls with a girl named April who I intended to marry. Think about four-hour conversations. I lived in Colorado. She lived in California. Four-hour conversations. Like, oh, four hours. No, it was never a drive. It was never dreary. I'm like, I could, we're going to talk. This is awesome. I mean, she obviously doesn't know me. She, she seems like she likes me. This is amazing. <laughs> and so it's like it's just a joy and a delight. And I, I wonder at times, what, what is wrong with my heart? The hearing from the creator of the universe wouldn't be even infinitely more compelling. Saxton goes on in his book to talk about meditating on God's truth, considering God's truth, thinking deeply about God's truth, and he compares it to Brussels sprouts. A lot of times we think of Brussels sprouts. I, I actually like Brussels sprouts, so this illustration might not work for me. Maybe it will work for you, but you get the point. Some people just look at it like, well, I'm sure it's good for you, so you kind of just have to eat them. And he just made the perfect observation. If that's the way you think about listening to God's word and especially meditating on the truth, you'll never do it. If it's just something that you think it's probably good for you, but I gotta just choke it down and get past it, you never, you never will. And perhaps you're, you might even be complacent while you're entertaining an inordinate desire. Just ask yourself about your actual habit of listening. What do you actually read in the morning, in the evening? What do you read most naturally? What types of books do you finish and what types of books do you not finish? What do you allow the kids to stay up late for? Movie, movie night? Oh, <laughs> bedtime's 10.30. Bible, Bible study? No. They, they got to get to bed at 7.15. What, um, what do you enjoy listening to? By way of music or even books on audio? What kind of conversations, of topics of conversation catch your interest? What do you search for most on the internet? What comes up most commonly on your searches, your streams, your feeds, your algorithms that recognize your viewing, your purchasing, your thumbs up on Twitter and Facebook tendencies? What kind of content are you drawn towards? If we're drawn towards something else, and if we're drawn towards something else, and that something else is revolving around one particular subject, you can mark it down. You've got an inordinate desire. There's idolatry that's preventing you from hearing and hearing well. And so this problem, this problem of an inordinate desire has to be answered by a delight in God. Grab your Bibles and open up to Psalm 1, verse 2. Let me show you this. This is a very familiar verse. We, we, I think we mentioned this last week, but I wanted to look at it real briefly. Psalm 1, remember how it begins, verse 1, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Instead, but 
His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. I mean, you think about uh, what it means to have a high standard of listening. You can't sit there and think, I've got this formula that I'm going to punch into my spreadsheet and follow the flow chart and the formula kind of works itself out and I arrive at this conclusion, well, voila, I did the formula and I now have quality listening. If, if I don't delight in God's law, I won't meditate on his, on his law. If I don't love God's word, I will never listen well or out-listen my inordinate desire with the truth. I've got to love the truth. I've got to love God's law. I've got to delight in God. That's the answer to this inordinate desire which is keeping me from hearing and hearing well. Meditation, we always meditate on what we love and cherish most. It's natural that we would think most, most deeply, most ardently, and most passionately about what we love the most, and we will act on it. We will pursue it. Flip over, just keep in the, stay in the Psalms here for a second. Look, look at Psalm 19, verses 10 and 11. You remember Psalm 19? This is that incredible psalm about revelation. You have six verses on general revelation, and then the last half of the psalm is on special revelation, or the scripture. And verses 7 through 9 have six labels for God's word, six functions of God's word, six adjectives describing what it does. And after that incredible bibliology in verses 7 through 9, he simply says this in verse 10. They, speaking about God's law and testimony, precepts, commandments, judgments. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. You think about all that you, all that you could possibly desire in this life. David says, your law, your word, your judgments, your truth is more desirable than gold. It's more desirable than the greatest thing this world has to offer. Sweeter also than honey, than the drippings of the honeycomb. So he's describing it, comparing it to the greatest value on earth or the greatest sweetness on earth. And he says the scripture is more valuable than anything on earth. It's sweeter than anything on earth. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. I mean, David believes that. He believes that. He knows. I mean, I've got this inestimable value in God's word, and in keeping it, there is great reward. I'd be a fool to not give all the value this world has to offer in order to simply keep God's word. That's a man who delights in God and who loves obedience and hates what God hates and loves what God loves. Let's look at one more example. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 97. This is a, uh, an incredible antidote to an inordinate desire. In verse 97, Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You know, if, if you look at this verse and you're like, man, I, I, don't, I don't meditate on God's law all the day because I've got this other thing that is just constantly competing with my attention and my affection, then that inordinate desire has to go and it has to be replaced with a superior love for God's law. If you love God's law the way this psalmist loves God's law, then it would be your meditation all the day. You would listen well. You couldn't stop listening to it. You couldn't stop thinking about it and thinking about its implications and just delighted with the prospect of actually carrying it out in your life, putting it into fruition. Your commandments, verse 98, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. He possesses God's commandments, and that's what gives him wisdom. Verse 99, I have more insight than all my teachers. Why do you have more insight than all your, all, all your teachers? For your testimonies are my meditation. He can't stop but thinking about God's word and listening to God's word and hearing it and meditating on it is like the chewing. You know, it's one thing that you just kind of have the, you know, quick bite that you just swallow because you're just trying to get something out of it. 
chewing it up and then you're actually able to digest it, that's a different reality altogether. Here is a, here is a psalmist who is sitting there saying, no, I love to just chew on God's word. And because I've chewed on it, meditated on it, thought about it, thought about the implications, and considered this truth from all these angles in light of God's character, and then what does that mean for me with my roles that God has given me in my family or with this relationship or in this responsibility at work? Lord, to see this truth carried out in my life would be so thrilling. I just want to think about this more and more and more, and then I want to act on it, and I will not be passive when you teach me the path forward. That's meditation. That's listening well. In obedience, when you love God's law, when you love his word, it may be difficult and it may be costly, but it's not a burden. Obedience is not a burden when that's your mindset. I mentioned uh, phone calls with a particular uh, April Price, soon to be April Anderson, when I lived in Colorado. And I remember calling her up in those days, and um, we had a, few, we had a couple, couple phone calls. Our first, I don't know, three or four phone calls were f- four hours long. And uh, this, is, this is before cell phones. Well, probably not before cell phones, but at least before I had a cell phone. And so I'm sitting there paying long-distance charges. You remember those? And, um, you know, when you're like a, just a recent college grad, I mean, you don't, you don't have a lot of money. And so four hours of long distance is, is pretty expensive. And um, four hours is a long conversation. And you better believe I never complained about paying for four hours of talking with April on the phone. I was never bored. It was costly. It's a long conversation. It was costly, actual dollars, funding a long distance service. But it wasn't a burden. It was not a burden. And so, if you see an inordinate desire, the only solution is to delight in God. And and when you delight in God, your your obedience is not... It it might be difficult. There's always a cost involved. But it's not a burden. It's always a privilege. Third category has a a few different faces to it. It's a very simple one. Pride and humility. Pride and humility. So the reason why we need to slow down on this one is because, you know, it would be unhelpful to just throw a generic label on specific sins. We could easily deceive ourselves with a a generic label, especially a biblical one. Um, If if we don't get as specific as our sin, we're not going to actually become good listeners. And so what I've done in this category of pride and humility, uh, pride has so many different ways of hindering our ability to listen to God's word, uh, that I've, I've selected three that I think will hopefully will be helpful for you, and then three uh, f- forms or aspects of humility that then will be a, a help to that particular hindrance. So the first hindrance, the first form of pride that is a hindrance is the, the pride of ability. The pride of ability. And obviously, the, the help here, the form of humility that helps, is dependency. So ability and dependency. This form of pride imagines that I have the ability to carry out the demands of the word. And this arrogance will vigorously pursue obedience. It will pursue conformity to God's word. It will pursue maturity. But it's going to meet with a kind of a roller coaster experience of exhilaration because of something that appears to be success and despair because of perpetual failure when it comes to the actual heart and the actual culture of the inner man because, voila, I have no ability to accomplish fruit in that realm. And so what happens here is this particular form of pride regularly finds smug satisfaction with externals and things that we can control, and we even start to resort to externalism to try to feel like we're listening well. And it becomes a shortcut for actual listening, actually carrying out what God's requiring, which is obviously always beyond our ability. So on this particular hindrance, this form of pride, which is the pride of ability, we've got to start preaching to ourselves. John 15, verses 4 and 5, Jesus in describing the vine and the branches. He said, apart from me, you can do quite a bit, but not enough. 
Remember it? I mean, it's just, how practical is that verse? It's just, I, I, this, this keeps coming up in my mind. He literally says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're going to be really, really theologically snarky, you might say, well, there's some things you can do, which is true. You can store up wrath for yourself on the day of judgment. You can disobey. You can defy God. You can stubbornly resist and refuse. You can harden your heart. You can, need I go on? Positively, you literally can do nothing apart from Christ. The antidote to this form of pride of ability is this dependency. We already saw it in even some of the other previous solutions and some of the helps, starting with Psalm 86. Teach me, O Lord. Independence, just going to the Lord. Arms up, I give up. You must teach me. I need you to teach me, Lord. I've got to hear this, and I've got to hear it well, and I am not naturally a good listener. In fact, naturally, I can't hear anything. I need help. That's humble. The solution here, again, starts with repentance. We need to acknowledge our pride, the pride of even imagining that we're spiritually capable, that we have strength, that we can even accomplish any good listening in and of ourselves. That's just pride. We've got to repent of that. We talked about this last hour in the equipping hour. In James chapter 3, verse 8, James says, no one can tame the tongue. And he, I don't believe he was exaggerating. That's not an overstatement. Literally, no one can tame the tongue. What man, what's impossible for man is possible with God. So we could say the same thing. No one can listen well, but what's poss- impossible with man is possible with God. How about repentance? God says in his word, repent. And how many times can we come to the obligation, the very real obligation to listen to God and repent and uh, try to accomplish it in our own willpower, to, to produce Repentance. I gotta to preach to myself. Acts 5:31, God granted repentance to the Jews. Acts 11:18, God granted repentance to the Gentiles. Are we obligated to repent? Yes. Do we have the ability to do it? No. That'll humble you. That's sweet to be able to go to the Lord and just put it, drive a stake into this form of pride that imagines ability where there is none. By acknowledging your inability, confessing that to the Lord, and looking to Him in faith. The second form of pride I want to mention is self-deception. And the the hindrance is the self-deception. The help here is effectual doing. Self-deception and effectual doing. And you know where that's coming from. James chapter 1. Let's just look quickly at James. And uh, we'll make sure we wrap this up quickly here. James chapter 1. James says, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who, watch this, delude themselves. And the word delude could even be, if it's stronger in your mind, go with deceive, who deceive themselves. Listen, before we finish reading this passage, One of the greatest forms of pride in a theologically rich environment is that we can so easily flatter ourselves, particularly with our listening ability, because of how much we have heard, how much we know, how familiar we are with these truths. And there's a lot of deceptive potential right there, um, especially if you have circles in your influence of family or friends in other churches that that don't necessarily devote themselves to teaching the word, and you can't help but be around them and realize, I know the Bible better than this person. And suddenly, there's a deceptive ability of our pride here to deceive ourselves and to say, well, of course you listen to the word well. I mean, look at how much you know. That's what James is trying to warn against here. Notice in verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. And James pictures what maybe some of you experienced this morning. You, you wake up and you go look in the mirror, you know, and you got you to assess the, uh, the damage of the previous night. You know, there's, there's drool there or some boogers or eye boogers or whatever. 
And you showed up here with all of that, and you said, no, I looked at the mirror this morning. We would only assume you totally forgot, somewhere between looking at the mirror and then making the proper corrections, you totally forgot to act on it. And that's the point. Verse 24, once he looked at himself, he's gone away. He forgot what kind of person he was. Verse 25, but the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, he lives in it, he remains there, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. The answer to the self-deception that comes, uh, that's a very potential threat to us in a theologically rich environment is to be an effectual doer. That's the, that's the help of humility there. The last one I want to mention is, this is where we, we ended last week in the um, Q&A. There's one, another form of pride that's the form we often call legalism, and the help here is faith. Let me just mention this. Hebrews chapter 4 Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, reminds us that it's very easy to hear the truth but not benefit from it because it's not united with faith. The author compares the church to the wilderness generation that heard Moses preach. And he says in verse 2, For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. There was no profit, no gain, no benefit, no advantage. Why, why does that connect with legalism? Look, look here's, here's what happens. Without a robust faith, without taking God's word in faith, what can happen is we can hear God's standard, and what kicks in is not humble faith that submits to what was required of us, looking to him to supply our lack, but what ha- kicks in at times is this kind of similar to the first form of of pride, which is this ability. But what happens is, is we start to create categories of the way we can carry out obedience to this or that text and actually pull it off in our flesh. That's legalism. Instead, what faith does is faith looks at the very high calling of what God tells us to do, and it acts in faith, trusting that God will supply what we are incapable of performing on our own. Let me give you three examples and we'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. Paul says this, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace did not prove vain toward me, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul in one verse describes an aggressive, zealous laboring. So when God says you need to labor in a certain area or a certain field, we have to labor. If we don't, we're disobedient. But laboring in our own strength would be a form of legalism. Paul didn't do that. He says, I labored more than all of them, yet yet not I. Is the grace of God with me. Grace of God working through me so that my laboring was not a form of pride, but I was actually listening to God when he said labor. Look at a second example, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and here's a, a great text that shows the tension here of obligation and divine ability that overcomes this legalism. In verse 12, Paul says, So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's the command. Okay, so if you want to put this into practice this morning, you go home and you say, Okay, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And how do you do that? Because how you go about working out your salvation with fear and trembling will reveal whether you're listening well or whether you're listening with pride and it's cutting you off from actually hearing that command. You must, you must actually work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's obligatory. If you don't, you're disobeying God. But the very basis for that statement comes in verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. On what basis, Paul, can you tell me, work out my salvation with fear and trembling? That is so far above my pay grade. It's so beyond my ability. Are you kidding me? Whoever obeys that? 
And you look out at the church and you see people obeying that. Like, what? Because God's the one working in them. When Christians humble themselves and look to the God who is working within us, and he's producing in us both the willing and the actual effective working, you will see actual conformity to God's word when you believe that. You must trust that. The last example is Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verses 28 and 29. We proclaim Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Now listen to verse 29. For this purpose I labor, striving according to his power, which works mightily within me. God tells Paul to go preach the gospel. So what's he do? I'm going to show him who's a preacher. I'm going to pull myself up on my bootstraps, and I'm just going to be a self-made preacher. No, he says, I, 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 have, I strived, I labored, I worked, I, the sweat equity that went into my ministry, but it wasn't me in the flesh. It was me striving according to his power. His power was working in me and through me, and it mightily works within me. And so there's an actual listening to God's word that says, yeah, you know what? That is actually beyond my ability. So I'm going to go ahead and pursue this by faith because when God enables me to obey it, he'll get all the credit and all the glory for it. This is the only way to hear God's word and to not walk away exhausted. When you hear with faith, it just becomes such a privilege. It's like, wow, there's more from God I can do. I can put this into practice in my life. He wants to do this. He wants to rule that area of my life. He wants to, oh, this is incredible. And suddenly hearing God's word is just the most refreshing part of our day. I hope this is helpful for you. I, I, my prayer is that this would help us to raise the bar on listening. It starts with doing it ourselves. And when we do that, the entire congregation is going to benefit from the blessing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for a, a week where we can just devote our attention to what you say in your word from all sorts of passages about how to listen and how not to listen, about some of the dangers and some of the temptations that we face on a regular basis, and how to wrestle those ground, to the ground with truth. And Lord, I'm just so thankful for the power of your spirit. Every true believer in here who's thinking about these truths as you articulated them in Mark 4 and as we've seen them lived out throughout the Psalms or in Paul's life or wherever, these believers here who are hearing this, I know they're saying that Wherever we've listened well, it is simply a proof of your grace. And we do want to raise the bar. We want to listen better. I pray that this would be our prayer, that this year, if there was a specific increment of measurement, if it was a, a few inches or a few feet, if we could raise the bar on our listening this year, help us to do so. We long to listen well. Thank you so much for being so lavish in your grace lavish in your promises. Thank you for even paying back to us when we sometimes, Lord, I feel like we listen at times with, I feel like my efforts in listening are so meager and the blessing that you give are so lavish. It's just ridiculous how kind you are to pay back to us for listening to your word. So help us to do that better. In your name we pray. Amen.